time for us to check back in with Alex Stewart and see what happens next in his life. If you missed that first reading, look in the description below for a playlist. Boyhood, Poor Little Bony Children. Alex Lewis Stewart, the second of 16 children, was born in 1891 near the top of Newman's Ridge in a tiny one-room log cabin which his father, Joe Stewart, had built a few years earlier. So remote was this locale during Alex's growing up years that roads were non-existent and the Stewart home place could not even be reached by wagon. There were numerous families living near them on the ridge, trying desperately to survive from the woods and from steep corn patches and garden spots. Today these families and their descendants are all gone from Newman's Ridge, and gone too are the huts and cabins where they lived. A half-standing chimney of unhewn stone, a few gnarled apple trees, and the trace of an occasional rail fence are all there is to indicate that people ever lived here. The little hillside fields once so laboriously cleared of trees are becoming forested once again. The Stuarts and their compatriots came into the forest primeval, confronting and conquering the untamed wilderness. Then they moved on, but not until Alex spent a romantic and memorable boyhood there. Alex talked a great deal about his grandfather, Stuart, but very little about his parents. He almost never mentioned any of his brothers and sisters. When one considers that he spent most of his formative years with the old members of the clan, it is understandable that his affinity was for them and that he was eager to talk of them. He doubtless was not only a very precocious little fellow, but one who was a helpful errand boy. He, in turn, was fascinated with every aspect of the grown-up culture, and he developed an unquenchable thirst to participate in it and to learn and understand all aspects of it. It was only when I gently pressed him that he would talk of his father's family. It wasn't that it was distasteful for him or unpleasant, but rather that he so thoroughly delighted in the memories of his grandparents that he preferred reminiscing of them. Tell me about your family, Alex. Well, Pap's name was Joe, and he had ten children by his first wife, my mother, and he had six by his second wife. I was next to the oldest. I had one sister older than me. Pap encouraged me to work, and the first work I remember doing was trying to plow an old bull that he had broke. Pat bragged on me, said, Why, son, you can plow pretty near as good as I can. I plowed that old bull and nearly made a crop with him myself. I was about eight or nine years old. I was barely big enough to hold the plow up, but I'd done some pretty good plowing. I'd take my pockets full of nubbins to the field, and when I'd get tired and have to take a rest, I'd feed the bull some of them nubbins, and he'd stand still. I was out there in the field a plowing one day, and there's a feller come along and wanted to buy that bull. He wanted him to log with. He went and talked with Pap about buying him, and Pap said, Why, I wouldn't take that bull away from that boy at all. We didn't have no horse nor a mule stock. All we had was that bull and an old cow. We kept the cow till she's 18 year old and sold her for $20. She's a great big old red and white faced cow. Mama took the flu and pneumonia and it killed her. Pap was 68 years old then and in a year or so he married another woman and they had six more children. Then he took sick and died and left them little bitty fellers. Only two of them was up to where they could do a little work. Their mother, she went blank, and them youngins just had to wander here and there to get something to eat. You talk about seeing it rough, they did. If people in the community hadn't taken pity's sake on them, I guess they would have left here, died. One of them stayed with me for a while. Two of them stayed down here with Brock Fleener, and they all managed to survive. One joined the Navy when he got old enough and never did come back here no more. He stayed there till he retired and he came back to this side of the ocean and they give him a job where the ships would anchor, a watching after them. 
he had a tumor on the brain and he died and he wanted them to bury him at sea so they buried him in the ocean all the rest of them boys lives around here and are doing real well they were as industrious all right talk about seeing hard luck they went through it till they got up where they could get out and take care of themselves how old was your father and what was the cause of his death he was 74 years old he died on his birthday no he was buried on his birthday poor old feller he'd seed a hard time he took typhoid fever and he lay from the time chestnuts got ripe in the fall till the next spring at corn planting time. You couldn't see how he lived. He was covered up with boils. Back then, the doctors couldn't do nothing with typhoid fever. They'd starve you to death. Now it's not much more to cure than pneumonia. They wouldn't let him eat anything? No, wouldn't let him eat hardly nothing at all. They just starved him. He never was very strong anyhow. Did your father take as much time to teach you things as your grandfather did? No, sir, he didn't. The biggest thing he ever used me for was to help him collect timber and to help him split it. He never took no pains to show me how to do things. He made chairs about all the time, churns, barrels, dough bowls, and spinning wheels. After I was grown and got started at the trade, he soon learned that I could beat him and that liked to have tickled him to death. You and your father, it seems, always got along pretty good. Did he ever whip you when you was a child? One time was all. We was coming home from meeting one night and I couldn't keep up with the rest of the family. I had a big rising on my leg and it was about to kill me. I couldn't walk. Pap thought I was just putting on, and he grabbed a switch and cut the blood out of both of my legs. I laid in the bed for two weeks over that, and the scars, I guess, are there yet. After he found out what my trouble was, he hated it awful bad, and he never did whip me anymore. Did you spend very much time with your father when you were small? He used to take me squirrel hunting with him when I was just a little towhead. He'd have me to go down below him in the woods to beat the leaves with a brush. That would scare the squirrels, and they'd sort of go toward where he was hid, and he'd kill them. I kept begging him to let me shoot the big old hog rifle, but he's afraid I'd miss. He didn't think I was old enough. Finally, he agreed to let me try it once, and I killed a squirrel the first shot. From then on, he would let me go hunting by myself. He never did have to hunt squirrels after that. I'd keep a count of how many I killed without missing. I killed 13 squirrels and one pheasant and never missed a shot. I made my own bullets. Pap would put up a little hay with a mowing blade and make a haystack or two, but most of the gardening and so forth he left to Mama. He never was much of a hand to farm. Your mother took care of that department? Oh yes, she took care of the house and gardens till I got big enough to help her a little. I've seen her many a day with her bonnet tied with a string out in the hot sun, just a digging and a working. I can see her just as plain. She never stopped. You don't see women wearing bonnets and working like that no more. I imagine she kept you and the other children pretty busy, didn't she, helping her do things? I'll say. I'd rather took a whooping than to see Mother getting ready to make a quilt. She'd lay a great lot of cotton around in front of the fireplace to dry out so me and the other children could take out the seeds. Every night we had to seed enough cotton to fill our shoes before we went to bed. I've sat there many a night and seeded cotton till my fingers was sore. I'd get my shoes full and I'd call Mother over to inspect. She'd take her hand and stuff that cotton plumb down in the toe, and I'd have to start all over again. You mentioned once having to help your mother pick the geese. Oh, I've helped do that many a time. Helped my mother and my grandmother, too. Grandma Stewart had 12 geese, and we'd pick them three times a year. We'd pick them along about the 1st of April, then up in May, and again in September. Would you get all their feathers? 
all but the wing feathers and the down. The down was white and puffy and laid right next to their skin. That's what made your next run of feathers. If you killed a goose to eat, then you get the down, but otherwise you'd let it grow more feathers. Them geese, after they was picked, was the funniest looking things you ever saw. They looked right scary for a while. So it was your job to hold them? I had to hold their heads so they wouldn't peck. If you didn't hold them, they'd grab a hunk of flesh out of you every time you got a handful of feathers. How did you know when a goose was ready to be picked? If you pick them too soon, you'll bring the blood every time you pick a feather. So you pick them when they get loose, just before they start to shed. You picked ducks also? We used to raise a lot of ducks, and I always liked to help pick them. Every time you'd pick a feather, they'd go quack, quack, quack. It would tickle me to death to hear them holler. How did you catch them? If you ever got ducks in a row, they would drive just like cattle. You could drive them in a stable or a pen and fasten them up. Then you could catch them one at a time whenever you got ready for them. You could pick one in 20 or 25 minutes. Duck feathers are not as good as goose feathers. They're coarser. What other kinds of feathers were used? Chicken feathers from the breast and from under the wing is about as good a feather as they is. The rest of their feathers has got a stiff quill that will stick through the cloth in a pillow or feather bed, the same way with turkey feathers. You could put a feather bed under you and on one on top of you, and I don't care how cold it got, it slept warm. We'd fill all our pillows with them and the bolsters. Do you know what a bolster is? A great long pillow that goes all the way across the bed. Taking corn to the mill was a job most country boys did at one time or another, it seems. Was that one of your chores? I've took many a turn of corn to the mill. Grandpap's second wife was a Collins, and her folks lived about two miles and a half below the Melungeons, and they was the only people in that whole settlement that had a corn mill. It had a big wheel on it, and it was powered by water. Now, Pap always planted his corn in March, and he had corn before anybody. Mama would put it in the oven and dry it out so it could be ground. I was just a little feller, eight or nine years old, and they would put half a bushel of corn on my shoulders and send me down to that mill. It took about all day to wait my turn. They was a bunch of fellers hanging around there, and when they found out my corn was good and dry, they would start eating it like it was parched corn. They would might near eat all my corn up before I could get it ground. You told me once that your grandfather, Livesy, made your first pair of shoes when you were about seven years old. How did you and other children manage to get through the winters without shoes? Oh, lots of children never knowed what a shoe was the whole winter through. Many a time I would go out in the snow barefooted to dig taters that we had holed up in the garden or maybe to get some wood. Why, son, I've waded the snow half deep without shoes. I've raked the snow off the ground so I could stand there a while trying to warm my feet a little. They get so cold they'd crack open and bleed and hurt me so bad of a night that I couldn't hardly sleep. When Grandpap Livesy made me that first pair of shoes, I was the proudest little feller ever you saw. When they started to tear up or wear out, Pap would fix them. I've held a pine torch many a time for him to mend my shoes. And some children never had shoes until they were much older. I would say some never had a pair of shoes on their feet till they's might near grown. I'd say two-thirds of the women who lived up there never had shoes, even for the winter time. They'd tie rags around their feet when they went out. Of course, when it was really cold, they didn't stir out too much. Them rags, once they got wet and froze, didn't help out much. Finally, they got to coming on with shoes here in the store. They called them brogans. We got to wearing them, and you'd go out and get them wet and set them around the fire of a night. The fire would die down, and then when you got up in the next morning, they'd be froze stiff. You could peck on them, and they'd sound like a gourd. Did some of the poorer families have a hard time getting enough clothes? 
Oh yeah, they just wasn't no clothes at all for most of the little fellers. They was a family named Campbell that lived on the upper end of our place. They'd get out and try to catch rabbits and things to eat. They had a little boy and they didn't have any clothes for him so they couldn't take him outside. They built a box to set him in close to the fire so he would stay warm while they was out hunting. One day it turned cold and when they come back the fire had gone out and that baby had froze to death. That was awful. I just sat here and study about things like that. A lot of folks went naked winter and summer. Why, well, I can remember my first pair of breeches. I wore my sister's old dress till I was a great big boy. I was four or five years old. You never thought nothing about seeing four or five kids going around stark naked. You never paid no more attention to that than if they had had on silk. I suppose your mother made her own soap. Law, I've seen Mama make hundreds of gallons of soap. She was the best soap maker in that country, and she had a certain time she'd make it according to the moon. We burnt hickory and blackjack wood all the time in the fireplace and got the ashes to make lye for the making soap. That's the only ashes that's fit for anything, and you have to burn green wood. She had two big ash hoppers full, and she'd put me to water in them hoppers to run lye. You had to pour just so much water at a time. Pour it slow and let it sink down. If you poured it too fast, it would run the ashes out in your lye. Did they use anything except hog parts for making soap? That's all. You could use any part of the hog. The skins, fat, scraps as well as the guts. Kill the hogs and split the guts and wash them. Then hang them up and let them dry. And that made good soap. Beef don't make good soap like hog lard. It just won't do it. There's nothing beats hog lard for making soap. Mother would use a feather to tell when her soap was strong enough. If the soap ate that feather down to the stem, then it was strong enough. But if it didn't, then she'd put in more lye. She'd put sassafras in her soap. I'd dig her some sassafras root and she'd wash them good and clean and cut them up and boil them a while in that lye and then flip them out. That took all the bad scent away and made your clothes smell good. Did your mother iron her clothes? Yeah, she was one of the few people around that knowed what an iron was. She had two great big old irons. Grandpap Stewart made them for her. While she was using one of them, the other one was by the fire getting hot. She could just keep ironing right along. If there was a bit of rust come on the face of them irons, all you had to do was wet it and take a little salt, rub it, and set it in front of the fire. Then you didn't have no rust. It'd be pretty and bright. The living conditions were pretty hard, apparently. You told me once that bed bugs were a problem, that they were a bother. Bed bugs? Oh, I'd say a bother. A bed bug's the same as a cinch. He's a little flat feller and stinks. Let him bite you and you mash him? Why, you can't hardly go to sleep for smelling him. I've seen them flat and as big as my fingernail. Just as long as the light burns, they won't bother you as bad. But you blow out the light and I'll say in five minutes, they'll eat you up. Strike a light and you'll see them going. They got a bill to them like a mosquito. They just bite right through your clothes. Cinches, they claim, hibernate on bats. You can kill or catch a bat, and you'll find it's got cinches all over it. They claim that when bats get into your house, that's how you get your start of cinches. Used to, bats would get in your house at night because the door was always left open in the summer. They'd hang from the joists and rafters and winter right there if you didn't watch. I ain't seen a bat in two or three years, but they used to fly thick at sundown. Them bats would see the light in your house and in they'd come. I'd get my coat or a hand towel and get them out. Alex's remark about bats flying into the house at night is most noteworthy. First, it indicated they had no glass windows or window screens. Although the process of making glass was known to man thousands of years before the birth of Christ, it is significant that the first factory in America, established in Jamestown in 1608, was a glass factory, and panes of glass were among the first articles transported to the frontier settlement, which became Nashville. 
This was in the late 1700s, over a hundred years before Alex's childhood, an indication of the primitive conditions that persisted on Newman's Ridge. I was raised in a house up on the ridge that didn't have a piece of glass in it. They wasn't a window nowhere, just a little hole and a shutter over it. We'd leave it open unless it was raining or awful cold. I was grown before I ever see the screen. In the summer, the only way you could sleep was to leave the shutter and the door open. In addition to bed bugs, I suppose head lice were also a problem. I'll say a problem. Just about everybody had lice at one time or another back then. They was them great big old lice, big as a match head. I don't see how some folks lived going lousy and dirty. They could have got rid of them if they just would. How do you get rid of them? Oh, they several remedies for lice. Creolin will get rid of them. You can take yellow sarsaparilla root, boil it down, and take all the water and wash yourself. It'll kill lice, nits, lice eggs, and all. Well, Alex, I know that you consider your childhood a happy one, and I don't want to talk about only bad times, but since we're on the subject of the difficulties of children, tell me about the problems caused by worms. Aww. Half of them little children didn't look like they could live, small and bony and eat up with worms. They didn't know how to get rid of them. The doctor come up to our home one time and we was all just eat up with worms. I was a standing there by the fireplace and my belly was just killing me. I'd take spells and might not die with it. Dr. Mitchell said to my mother, Don't you know what to do for that? She said, No, I've given them several kinds of stuff, but seems like it ain't doing them no good. He said, Don't you know wormweed? The yard's full of it. It's that weed that stinks so. You get out there and gather a handful and put it in a pint of molasses and cook that till it gets hard enough to make candy. Then let them eat that. Well, she fixed that in a pan of molasses, and I ate, I guess, all you could hold in your hand. It tasted good to me. The next morning, I went out of doors, and these 52 worms come from me at one time, just clean worms. Some of them were over a foot long. It's a wonder it hadn't killed you. Oh, they killed lots of children. I've been to children's burials where there wasn't nothing in the world wrong with them but worms. Oh God, that was trouble. Poor little old bony children. The round worm and the pin worm are probably the most common human parasites and were likely the type to which Alex alluded. Infestation comes from the eggs of the species and a person acquires these eggs by eating unwashed food or from poor sanitary conditions in general. The absence of toilet facilities and the inability to control the housefly population were enough to cause constant problem with these parasitic worms. When Alex told me of these terrible conditions, I was appalled. I grew up in the mountains of southern Appalachia and thought I was familiar with all forms of deprivation, but the sordid conditions he described presented a new dimension to the often romanticized frontier family. It's not a pleasant part of the picture, but it cannot be ignored. And it should cause all of us to be more appreciative of our modern day conveniences. The first toilet ever I seen was built right down there on Lou Trent's place, and I didn't know what it was. I was walking to school and passed along there. I asked one of his granddaughters what they was building, and she said it was a playhouse. She was ashamed to tell me it was a house where they went to do their business. So there were no outdoor toilets in your community during your boyhood days? Oh no. In the summertime, folks would generally use the woods around the house, and if the youngins went out at night, they'd just step out the door and sit down anywhere. Now in the wintertime, they'd just sit across a pole and do their business right at the back of the house. They drive two forked stakes in the ground and put another pole in those two forks, just like you was making a place to hang your wash kettle. It would be about two feet off the ground, and that's where they'd go. Why, it wasn't a bit more to walk up on somebody doing their business than it was to walk up and meet them in the road. They never thought about getting out of sight. That's the biggest thing the dogs had to eat. 
They didn't have enough food for the children, let alone the dogs. If they didn't have a dog, that manure would pile up their two feet, and when spring came, it was awful at the smell. During winter nights when it was raining or when it was very cold, what did people do about toilet facilities? I've seen them take a board, they didn't have iron shovels, and pile ashes on the hearth, and that's where the kids would do their business. They'd dirty right there on the hearth let it lay there all night and the next morning take it and throw it out. I remember mighty well the first time I ever heard of a bucket that you could set under your bed, chamber they called it, mommy got her one. Grandpa Stewart made it out of wood. It was a big round thing that she put ashes in, you know, and she'd take it out and empty it of a morning. It was sort of like a dough bowl and for sick folks, they'd slip that old bowl under them, let them lay there wet and nasty in it, wasn't fit, didn't look like it for a hog to lay in, but that was the best they could do. Did they ever dig a hole in the ground to use as a toilet? No, they never thought about digging out a hole, like for a toilet or nothing like that. One of our neighbors had a great big family, about 16 children. Right out from his house, about as far as from here to the woodshed, a distance of 30 feet, is where they'd go, just whenever the pain struck. It was awful to step out there. What a time they had. And the flies, Lord, them piles would just be solid black with flies. They would bother you to death, and it didn't get rid of them. They'd just take over. I've seen black swarms of flies in people's houses. If you ever saw a piece of food, why, it'd just be covered with flies. Mother used to make fly traps out of straw. She'd take a needle and a thread and sew wheat straws together, and the trap, when it was finished, would be in the shape of an egg, sort of pointed on both ends. It would be about the size of a gallon bucket. The flies could go in from one end, but they couldn't get out. They was trapped in there. How did she get rid of them once she caught them in the trap? She'd hold them over a steaming kettle, and that would kill them. Then she'd open the trap and get shed of them. There was a weed that growed around here that we'd kill flies with. You'd put it in a bucket and mix some molasses with it. Then you'd bake a big pone of cornbread and take just the crust off and cut it to fit on top of that bucket. You cut a hole in that cornbread crust and the fly would light on the cornbread and smell the molasses through that hole. When he went down in the hole, the scent of that plant killed him dead. She'd catch a bucket of flies that way. It'd get mighty nigh every fly on the place. Do you remember the name of the plant? For the life of me, I can't think of the name of that plant. This was the only time I found Alex unable to recall something. It used to grow right down from the barn. Plenty of it. It's a hateful weed when it gets started growing. Just takes over everything and you'll want to get shed of it. I kept on fighting it till I got rid of it. So, a uh, really interesting but really disgusting part of the of the book today. But like uh, the author says, those were just the realities, and it is. Uh, as you know, I have a weak stomach, so a lot of that's really hard for me to read or to even think about. But it's it is to compare it with how wonderful we have it today. It is kind of. Um, sobering I guess makes you really be grateful for what you have and what you've been blessed with because those conditions were so horrible uh, and a lot of them you know today with our knowledge we see were unnecessary you know they got the worms and all that uh, from the, their living conditions I, I can imagine the way that he describes the people going to the bathroom I'm positive that's where most of the worms come from uh, and then the because of that then the flies that also attracted all the flies so just a, a terrible conditions, which really makes you amazed that they lived. And then he, you know, he, of course he lived, but then also he talked about, you know, his poor little brothers and sisters, the second set of his father's family, how they were all uh, doing well and making it good, except the one that had the tumor, but the, uh, he had left anyway when he was in the Navy, he certainly didn't die from childhood diseases, but it just amazes you that they even could live through that. Some of the parts I did like, even though I didn't care for the, you know, it's really hard to read about people having to live in those terrible conditions. Uh, and as I said, I have a weak stomach, so it's hard for me to, to read those parts anyway. But the things I did like about it, in the very beginning of it, when he talks about how his daddy bragged on him, 
uh, when he could use the uh, plow with the bull. I really liked that part. I always felt so good when I was a kid if Granny or Pap or Papa or Mama or Granny or anybody, Granny Gazzy bragged on me and told me that I did something good. That just made me feel so good, made me feel so proud, so I liked that part. When he's talking about the nubbins that he took along with the a bull as he was plowing. If you don't know what a nubbin is, that's a really small ear of corn. So that's what he had. Maybe one that hadn't fully de developed. Those are nubbins, we would call them um, here in Appalachia. There's also a word in this part that I really like, compatriot. Pap used that word, compatriot, to talk about his friends and maybe people that he served in the military with, but just friends that he grew up with, or maybe even um, friends that he had, you know, in modern day life that that they were a good compatriot is something he might say about someone. So I really like that they that Alex used that word. Even though with all the poorness, all the, the terrible, you know, the lice and the no clothes and the no shoes and all that, it is amazing how much skills, the skills they had, even along with all the poverty from the, and the worms and the bed bugs and the no clothes and no shoes, uh, even along with that, how much knowledge they had about day-to-day -day things, you know, from his mother catching the flies, trying to get rid of them, to even his daddy teaching him there at such a young age to actually plow the garden with the with the bull, and I'm sure he took part in planting it, and then he says his mother was really in charge of that and making sure everything was done. Uh, and then even to his grandfather who made the wooden vessels who eventually taught uh, Alex how to do that. Such amazing skills and makes me again wish, I don't wish for that poverty at all, but I wish for those skills. I wish I had more of them. It is interesting and uh, the author, John Rice, Irwin, he, he notices that. I mean, he points that out how Alex really wants to talk about his grandparents, not his parents. And it's not that he didn't care for his parents. You can tell when he's talking about his pap and his, his mother talking about her that he did really care for them. But somehow at this at his stage in life, at his age, who he really wants to talk about is his grandparents. And they had such an influence on him. Uh, my grandparents had an influence like that on me. I wish uh, my I wish they'd had a greater influence. I wish I'd paid more attention, if that makes sense. My Mama Marie, she died when I was in fifth grade. My Papa Wade, he had a, a huge influence. Probably the most influence came from him because he lived here in Wilson Holler and he lived till I was grown. Uh, Matt and I just started uh, started dating when he died. Uh, Granny Gazzy lived uh, till I was married and had kids. Uh, her, the last few years of her life, though, she didn't really know anyone. But I wish so much that I'd spent more time with them, that I'd soaked up every morsel of everything I could. But of course, we don't always think of that. We're busy living our life, especially when you're young and you, you know, you're interested in your friends and and doing whatever young people do. So uh, I certainly wish that I had that more. I try to stress that always to Corey and Katie, and to try to make sure that they they gain that knowledge and ask those questions to Granny and Pat before he died, to Miss Cindy, to Papa Tony. And um, I think they have more so probably than I did. They've had a closer kind of relationship in that regards as far as asking a lot of questions. But I know there'll become a time that they'll probably wish that they had asked more like all of us do. So after the first reading last week, I had two really interesting comments, so I want to share those. One of them was from Matthew Brandon, and he actually found a video of Alex Stewart. So I'm going to link to that. I will put that in the description below so that you can go and watch it. It's very enjoyable. Um, and really makes the makes him come alive then you can really there he is you can picture uh, picture him in your mind the way that he looks reminded me a lot of my papa wade because he was a smaller man and he always wore uh, overalls so that's thank you matthew brandon for sharing that and i'm put that link in the description below then also a comment from matthew stewart who is the um, grandson and great grand or so Oh, let me get this right. Matthew Stewart, who Alex was his great grandpa. Alex was his great grandpa, Matthew Stewart. But his Alex's grandson and great grandson are Coopers today. So that's really fascinating. So wonderful that their family is continuing on the work that uh, Alex did. And Matthew Stewart, if you're watching this video, maybe if there's a place that people could purchase those their products, maybe they sell them. Uh, from home or maybe they sell them at a local 
um, business or something like that, please let us know. There might be someone on here that would love to have one of those wooden vessels. So I hope you enjoyed this portion of the book, even though it was kind of difficult to read. But as John uh, Rice Irwin said, it's kind of, that was just, that's real life. That's what it really was. It wasn't just the romantic uh, parts. There was hard times and tough times for people and things they had to deal with that wasn't very nice or very fun. So it was just, uh, uh, and <laughs> although it was difficult, it was a peek into real life. But please leave a comment and let me know what parts jumped out at you. And please drop back by next Friday because now we've got to find out what happens next to Alex Stewart.